thank you for the um, introduction. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I am very excited to talk to you about a diverse and efficient approach to CRISPR technology. Um, by the end of this seminar, I hope that you will have a better understanding of mechanisms of CRISPR action, um, some practical tips for designing the CRISPR system, some practical tips for understanding the delivery mechanisms of uh, CRISPR components into cells, and how Vector Builder, the company that I work for, can help you with your CRISPR design, delivery, and application um, needs. So to start, um, modulation of genes has been and is very crucial to understanding biological functions. For the longest time, we did not have the tools to be able to do that. And in the recent past, there was zinc finger nucleases and talons, which were used for this purpose. However, they were labor intensive, time intensive, and technically pretty complex to achieve. In the early 2010s, CRISPR came into the field and since then has revolutionized the whole field of gene editing and gene modulation. Um, and today we use CRISPR for gene knockdown, knock up, gene regulation, and a whole bunch of other uh, applications that I hope that I will get to talk to you about today. So CRISPR-Cas9, the classical CRISPR-Cas9, contains two main components. One is the Cas9 endonuclease. Uh, it's a protein, it's an enzyme. It is an RNA-guided DNA nuclease. That is the first component. And the second component is a guide RNA. Uh, the guide RNA guides the Cas9 protein to the target sequence to be able to induce double-stranded breaks, which we will talk about in a second. Even though Cas9 and guide RNA are the classic components of the CRISPR system, a lot of more, as the technology has emerged, a lot of modifications and a lot of improvements and advancements have come to the field in terms of Cas9. So I want to talk to you about some of the uh, commonly used Cas9 um, proteins in the CRISPR-Cas system. One of them is um, codon-optimized Cas9 from Streptococcus pyrogenes. This is one of the most commonly used Cas9 proteins. It is modified to be used in different species like HCas9 in humans, ZCas9 in um, zebrafish, so forth and so on. Another Cas9, which is used in a specific delivery system, um, adeno-associated virus, AAV, is SACas9. Both of these Cas9s induce double-stranded breaks in the DNA. And sometimes you don't want the double-stranded breaks. You want to be able to use Cas9 to have some effect at the target site, but not make the break. In such case, you will use catalytically inactive Cas9 uh, or DCas9. And there are also other Cas9s um, called D10A, which are micases. They are known to introduce single-stranded breaks as opposed to the double-stranded breaks introduced by the, uh, your typical Cas9. And single-stranded breaks in a CRISPR uh, system has a whole range of applications and a lot of advantages, which we can talk through a little bit today in the, in the presentation. And then there is the base editing Cas9, where the Cas9 enzyme has been modified and fused with deaminases to be able to introduce very specific base substitutions at the target site without um, the use of a donor vector. Similarly, there is prime editing Cas9, in which the Cas9 enzyme is modified and fused with reverse transcriptase to be able to introduce very, very specific um, substitutions or deletions or additions at the target site without the donor vector. So Cas9, even though the classical uh, Cas9, as we know, can introduce double-stranded breaks, has been modified a, by for various applications. So how exactly does CRISPR work? So the two components, guide RNA and Cas9, are introduced as a complex into the host cell. Um, and once they're inside the cell, guide RNA, as the name suggests, guides Cas9 into the target site. And this is mediated by complementary base pairing of guide RNA with the genomic DNA. And once the guide RNA Cas9 complex is in, uh, targeted to a very specific site, if there is a PAM sequence, 
next to the target site. And a PAM sequence is a specific motif, is a specific nucleotide sequence, which typically happens to be NGG, but it could be something else as well. If the PAM sequence is present, then Cas9 um, does its thing and introduces double-stranded breaks in the target site. And once there is a double-stranded break, there could be two things that ha can happen. The first one is non-homologous end joining, which um, you can see here on the screen. It's a repair pathway. Because there is a double-stranded break, the cell's DNA repair mechanism comes jumps into action and it wants to repair the damage that has happened here. This non-homologous end joining pathway though is error prone. It can make some mistakes. And in that process of repairing, some mistakes happen. More commonly, deletions happen, more rarely, um, substitutions and additions can also happen. By that mechanism, mutations are introduced at the target site where the cut happened. And if this mutation is in a coding region causing a disruption of the gene, for example, a frame shift mutation, then that leads to knockout of, of that specific gene. Non-homologous end joining, in fact, is um, one of the most commonly used methods to be able to generate a knockout. One thing to remember if using non-homologous end joining pathway to generate knockouts is that this is more of a quick and dirty method of generating a knockout. What I mean by that is if this, if a guide RNA and Cas9 uh, complex is introduced into a pool of cells, the mutations are random. So there is a heterogeneous population of cells with different mutations within the cell population. So sure, you'll get a knockout, but the mutations might be different. So if you want something more sophisticated, if you want to know specifically what the mutation is and use it for more sophisticated experiments, you may want to isolate single clones, um, sequence the DNA, understand what the mutation is, grow that cell population, and then use that for uh, different experiments. The other mechanism that can happen at the double-stranded break is called the HDR repair pathway or homology-dependent repair pathway. So how this works is that there is a double-stranded break and we introduce another component here, which is a donor DNA. So the donor DNA typically contains the insertion site, what we want to be present at the break site, along with two homology arms uh, targeting the, the site of where the double-stranded break happened. And through the, the homology, homologous recombination, the target site, which we presented here in the donor DNA, gets inserted into, um, into the double-stranded break target site. And this method is used for generating both gene knockouts and gene knock-ins. So for gene knockouts, you can use a target uh, donor vector with a very, very specific mutation a point mutation that you can insert into the target site that can give you a knockout. Or if you want to introduce something a little bit bigger, it could be a big protein, it could be a tag, it could be a restriction site, whatever you want to knock in into that target site, you can include that on the donor DNA and uh, introduce that into the cell. And that will be able to get into the target site through homologous recombination. We talked a little bit about how to generate knockouts and knock-ins, and this is one of the most widely used applications of the CRISPR system. One of the other um, uh, applications is using the CRISPR system to regulate genes. So the principle here is that catalytically inactive form of Cas9 is used. Um, so it can be directed by the guide RNA into a target site, but it cannot induce a double-stranded break. And then this dead Cas9, DCAS9, is then fused with different transcriptional complexes, whether for activation or repression, so that those phenomena or those processes can happen at that specific target site. Um, using CRISPR to regulate genes, you can either activate or repress gene transcription at the genomic level. So what I'm showing here is an example of um, CRISPR-A system, which is a SAM system, which is one of the most popular CRISPR-A systems, in which both the Cas9 and the guide RNA have been modified to be able to recruit transactivational complexes uh, to the uh, genomic loci where this whole situation is happening. So because they get recruited, the transaction activation complexes get recruited to the site, 
it leads to transcriptional activation of the downstream gene. On the other hand, on the contrary, there's CRISPR-I, where the inhibition happens, where Cas9 is fused with transcriptional repressor complexes, CRAB and MECP2. So when Cas9 dynamic complex is localized to a specific site, um, and that includes um, recruitment of repressor complexes, there is repression of the downstream gene. One thing to note about this system is that the target sites here tend to be regulatory regions that are non-coding. For knockout and knock-in, that tends to be typically the coding region. But in here, it's usually the promoters, enhancers, what have you, the regulatory regions um, tend to use the CRISPR system to regulate genes. So we talked about maybe identifying the function of a specific gene by either knocking it out or by knocking it in, upregulating it or downregulating it and seeing what happens, what the function is. One of the other really important functions of the CRISPR system is to be able to identify genes based on a specific function. So you can use it for really powerful forward genetics um, screening. And one way to do that is by using CRISPR screens. So what happens here is that a whole genome or a subset of genes or a specific pathway, genes involved in a specific pathway can be directed by designing guide RNAs for those specific genes. They will be cloned and they, this guide RNA um, library is then introduced into the target cells. And once they're introduced into the target cells, they are screened for a specific phenotype. Um, you can apply pr uh, selection pressures, drugs, um, whatever, to see how these transduced cells, uh, cells that contain the guide RNA library, um, respond to these pressures and then select the cells that give you the desired phenotype and then identify what are the genes that could be responsible for this specific function or this specific phenotype. This is a very, very powerful tool you can do multiple things with it. Um, functional screens of coding genes, gain of function or loss of function screens, whole genome or pathway specific screens, or you can even generate stable cell line to further study pathways and for drug development. So hopefully I've given you an idea of um, the overview of how the CRISPR system works and what are some of the very general broad applications of the system. I want to spend a little bit more time on talking through the experimental tips, um, practical ways to successfully design a CRISPR experiment. So a, the, the CRISPR system is a multi-component system like we talked about. There is the Cas9 and there is the guide RNA. And it's really the very first step in designing a su successful CRISPR experiment is designing the vector. So get, getting the right guide RNA, getting the right Cas9, and if there are other vectors involved, like donor vectors, choosing the right ones and designing the correct ways. Uh, what that means, I'll talk to you about it in just a second. And once you have designed your vector, the next step is getting these vectors, these components, into the cell. And these... CRISPR components can be introduced into the cell through many different ways, either plas plasmid transfection, viral transduction, um, IVT RNA transfection, RNA electroporation. Each of these techniques we will go through in detail. Both vector design and the method of delivery that you choose for your CRISPR experiment heavily depends on your target cell, what type of cell it is, its identity, where is it located, and what your experimental goals are. So let's um, shift focus to vector design specifically and talk through some practical tips for vector design for a successful CRISPR experiment. When you are designing a CRISPR experiment, you may want to ask yourself some questions to make it um, successful and effective. First one is, do I want to use all-in-one or separate vectors? What this means is that both the Cas9 and guide RNA can be introduced into the same vector called an all-in-one vector and then introduced into cells. Or you can have two separate vectors, one for guide, guide RNA and one for Cas9, and they can be introduced separately into the cells. Each of these systems, they have their own pros and cons. An all-in-one system, um, as you can imagine, is very easy. Um, technically, you just 
transfect or deliver it once into the cell, and you can be sure that both components have been delivered. However, depending on the type of Cas9 and other vector components like marker, whatever, sometimes um, it can be too big and heavy, um, and that can lead to less efficiency um, of the delivery system. And separate vectors, you can do that, but that can cause some kind of inconsistency. One cell might get just the Cas9, one cell might get just the guide RNA vector. So in order to make sure both of them are co-expressing might be a little bit of a challenge. Uh, what I'm showing here is an example of an all-in-one vector. This is for a mammalian CRISPR vector. As you can see, there is there are two guide RNAs actually, um, driven by a U6 promoter, and then there is the Cas9 protein being <laughs> in this exact same vector, all in one vector. The second question you want to ask is which Cas9 do I want to use? And I talked about the different Cas9s that are available. So you could use uh, a codon optimized Cas9 that is suitable for your specific species that you're working with. Or you can use any cases if you're interested in causing single standard breaks, or you can use CRISPR-A or CRISPR-I specific Cas9s if you are interested in a gene regulation experiment. So multiple different options are available. So you choose your Cas9. And the next question you ask is, if I want to use one or two guide RNAs. The example that I've shown here has two guide RNAs. And it's a very, um, the choice between one and two, again, depends on what your experimental goals are. For a typical straightforward knockout experiment um, using conventional Cas9, single guide RNA generally works. But two guide RNAs are necessary and useful in some cases. For example, if you're using a Nikase, um, which causes single-stranded breaks instead of double-stranded breaks, in that case, you can use two guide RNAs, one cutting the upper strand and one cutting the lower strand at the same target site, um, causing double-stranded breaks. What this does is that because you have to use two guide RNAs instead of one, this reduces off-target effects by a lot. Or if you want to cause two double-stranded breaks um, and want to delete the chunk of DNA in between, you'll use two guide RNAs. Or if you want to target two different genes at the same time, then you'll use two guide RNAs. So the choice of whether you will use one or two depends on what your experimental goals are. And the next thing, question you want to ask is the PAM sequence and the guide RNA selection. So this is very crucial. And both the PAM sequence and guide RNA are dependent on the type of Cas9 that you will use. So for uh, the one of the most common ones, HCas9 that I have shown here, um, the PAM sequence tends to be NGG. But for other systems, if they Cas9, which we'll talk about, the PAM sequence is different. And the guide RNA is also different. So the guide RNA and PAM sequence have to be compatible with the Cas9 that you've chosen. For CRISPR-A, the guide RNA is slightly different. So it is extremely important to make sure that the PAM sequence and the guide RNA that you've chosen are compatible with the Cas9 that you're using. The next question you want to ask if, is if I want to add a marker. Um, we generally recommend using some kind of marker that helps with identification of cells, selection of cells, um, like a drug selection marker or a fluorescent recorder helps in visualization. It's always a good idea to do that. The last thing you want to think about is what is my target site? So if you're doing um, knockouts or knock-ins, typically this happens in the coding region, but if you're doing CRISPR-A, CRISPR-I, this typically happens in the regulatory region. So you want to keep that in mind when you're designing your vector. This is another example um, of designing the vectors and the vector components for the CRISPR system. What I'm showing here is a AAV vector, and this is a single guide RNA AAV vector. This is also an all-in-one vector where guide RNA and Cas9 are expressed in the same vector. You will notice that here the Cas9 is not HCas9 or um, S Cas9, it's SA Cas9, which is specific to work with AAV. SA Cas9 is much smaller in size. Um, that's because AAV has a cargo capacity about 4.2 kb. It cannot carry a huge, um, huge chunks of uh, huge things within it. So in this case, the Cas9 is smaller 
And it functions differently from the conventional SP-Cas9 that we've talked about. And SA-Cas9 requires a different guide RNA sequence called the SAG RNA. And the PAM sequence for SA-Cas9 happens to be NNG or RT, which is different than the more conventional, more commonly used PAM sequence of NGG. Uh, again, this is an example of your PAM sequence and your guide RNA being compatible with the uh, Cas9 that you have chosen. All right, once you have answered all the questions and decided the right uh, kind of vector components for your experimental needs, the next step is selecting a delivery system and how you deliver the CRISPR components into your host cells. So for this, Broadly, there are two main categories. There's viral vectors and non-viral vectors. So both viral and non-viral vectors, they have plenty of popular options, and they both have options where transient uh, temporary expression is possible and also more long-term stable expression is possible. And whether you choose a non-viral vector or a viral vector, again, depends on your experimental needs. So for non-viral vectors, the method of delivery is typically transfection. So this could include methods like electroporation, injection, lipid nanoparticle mediated delivery. And because the non-viral vectors have to be delivered through transfection, this can cause some um, difficulty in the delivery process itself. So there is some difficulty in delivery. It's more challenging to um, for non-viral vectors to be delivered inside the cell. And they, it, some cells might be harder to transfect than others. And it might be a little bit of a challenge to transfect um, non-viral vectors into in vivo systems. However, on the contrary, viral vectors, one of the biggest um, advantages of using viral vectors is the ease of delivery. What happens in viral vectors is your CRISPR components are packaged into a specific virus and the host cells are exposed to this virus. And viruses, as they do, will infect the host cell and then in, uh, in turn carry your CRISPR components into the host cell. So because of that reason, the delivery is pretty easy and they can also uh, infect a wide variety of cells, making delivery part of it pretty easy. However, because it involves packaging all of these components inside a virus, production seem, tends to be a little bit more complicated. Producing these viral vectors is a little bit more complicated. And because, of, because these are viruses, once they're inside the cell, they might generate some sort of um, immune response within the, within the cell, which does not happen in non-viral vectors. They're much easier to produce. They're a little bit harder to deliver, but much easier to produce. And um, they have low toxicity and low immune responses in the host cells. So which one you use uh, depends on what are the things that you are looking for in your experimental goals. And I want to go over some of the popular options in detail, what the advantages are, what the limitations are, and show you um, some successful examples where we have used it for successful um, delivery and results of CRISPR components. The first one I wanna to talk to you about is a regular plasmid. You would use a regular plasmid and transfect it into the cells. Um, the, trans, uh, the expression here is transient. It does not integrate into the host genome. Um, so the expression is transient. And this is uh, an, a gene editing with all-in-one regular plasmid, the data that I'm showing here. So what is happening here is that we have our vector components, guide RNA and um, Cas9 all in a single vector. And we're transfecting this vector into a human embryonic kidney cells that are expressing GFP. So after, two, after 72 hours, when we check, like you can see, um, all the cells are transfected and the controls, non-transfected and scrambled guide RNA, um, the control, the level of expression of GFP is pretty high, but in both guide RNA transfected vectors, guide RNA one and guide RNA two, um, the GFP expression is pretty low because the guide RNA is targeting the GFP here. Another um, popular option for non-viral delivery 
is IVT RNA, which is in vitro transcribed RNA, in which the guide RNA and Cas9 mRNA um, are delivered into the host cell by chemical transfection or electroporation. One of the characteristics of this method of gene delivery is that the expression of Cas9 is transient. Because it is RNA, it does not integrate into the genome. Um, the, the expression of Cas9 is, is transient. And one of the biggest advantages of this specific system is in the creation of IVT mRNA, there is a great deal of uh, control for optimization of high level of expression. We can control for um, stability and expression levels. So the, it is pretty efficient that way. And because we are introducing mRNA into the cells, transcription does not have to happen inside the cell, which means that the action of the CRISPR system is pretty fast and efficient. It's almost ready to go. And because it's RNA, it will not integrate into the host genome. And there is also capability, depending on the delivery method, uh, of tissue targeting, targeting specific tissues. On the other side, there are some limitations. Um, in the production side of this, there is an additional transcription step that you would have to do. You would have to in vitro transcribe the RNA first and then introduce it into the cells. And editing is transient um, because RNA inside the cell gets degraded um, quickly. Transcripts are degraded, so the effect is short-lived, which can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what the application is. Um, you know, what this means, editing is transient. What this means is that the off-target effects are minimized because it's not long-lasting, long-lasting, and um, it's great for clinical applications. But if you want to create libraries and stuff like that, this might not be the best system. And here's an example of how we have used uh, IVT mRNA and guide RNA for gene editing. Similar things, uh, human embryonic kidney cells um, expressing GFP. We have targeted the GFP here with guide RNAs. And as you can see, these are our controls. This is just Cas9 mRNA and this is um, controlled without anything. The GFP expression is pretty high, as you can see here as well. And in both guide RNAs, GFP expression is um, reduced, indicating that you know, IVT mRNA and guide RNA um, is a good delivery system and is actually functionally validated. This system of um, IVT RNA with uh, mRNA and guide RNA complex can also be used in vivo and uh, here is an example of how we have done that. So what we've done here is Cas9 mRNA and guide RNA was encapsulated in LNP and um, injected into mice. And we extracted genomic DNA at day two and day seven. What you see here is a T7 assay. What, is, what it is essentially showing us is that if there was a mutation that happened, then you will see multiple bands on the gel, depending on where the site of the mutation is. If mutation did not happen, then you will see one single band around 1,000 base pairs. So you can see here um, both uh, in vitro transcribed and chemically synthesized uh, mRNA for Cas9 at a um, three microgram RNA per gram of body weight concentration was able to successfully introduce mutations um, in vivo in mice. And the last method I want to talk to you about uh, for a non-viral delivery is RNP electroporation, which is a ribonucleic protein electroporation. So here we use a preformed guide RNA Cas9 RNP complex. So this is a Cas9 protein and the guide RNA. This is delivered by electroporation. And similar to the mRNA, the expression of Cas9 here is transient. And this also has some very distinct advantages. Uh, Cas9 doesn't have to be translated. It's already a protein, so very, very fast activity. And it's, it's suitable for difficult to transfect cells. And it does not require any kind of cell type specific promoter because there is no transcription necessary here at all. We are directly introducing the Cas9 protein. And because it's a protein, not DNA, there is no risk of integration into the genome. And there is also low cytotoxicity.
However, the biggest limitation of this method is that it requires expensive equipment to be able to do this. And the activity is also, again, transient because the complex can de get degraded, um, because of which the whole CRISPR activity is a little bit um, transient. And it has got some uh, limited use in vivo. Um, this is very heavily used in some cell types like iPSCs, um, like I'm showing here. Uh, but in vivo use, it's a little bit more difficult. So here is an example of uh, using the RNP, RNP uh, system to introduce EGFP, knocking in EGFP um, in, in iPSCs. So a very similar um, method of what I have shown you before of using a um, Cas9 and gRNA RNP complex. And in addition to that, we've used a donor vector, which contains the GFP to knock in into the sequence. And here in through Sanger, Sanger sequencing, you can see that um, the EGFP sequence is present and knock in is successful, which was also identified using on um, genotyping. This is the wild type, which is around 800 base pairs, and the um, EGFP protein is about 2,400 base pairs. So if the knock-in is successful, you'll be able to see it around 3,200 base pairs, which you do. And you can also see expression of GFP in here, indicating that, you know, we were able to successfully knock in GFP. So the non-viral methods that I talked about, um, especially the RNP mediated method and IVT RNA, they're transient. And if you are looking for something a little bit more stable, a little bit more permanent, for example, creation of libraries, then a viral transduction might be the way to go. So in within viral transduction, there are multiple different viruses that are available. There's lentivirus, A, V, and adenovirus are the most popularly used. Uh, viruses to deliver the CRISPR components into mammalian cells. However, lentivirus is the most popular option, uh, mainly because it can transfect both, uh, transduce both uh, dividing and non-dividing cells. It integrates into the genome, meaning that it can have long-lasting effects. It is also uh, very useful to deliver CRISPR components into a wide variety of cells. So because of all these things, um, lentiviruses are the go-to virus for viral transduction. Um, it can be used in vivo and in vitro, and it causes efficient transduction in most cell types. Um, great integration and very good for library construction. One, because of the integration, um, and two, because the integrated guide RNA can be used as barcodes to read the depletion or enrichment of specific guide RNAs in a library system. One of the limitations, um, this is a limitation specific to most viral vectors, is that it's technically complex um, because you have to package the components into a virus and you may need a biosafety level lab to be able to um, use the viral method of transduction. Um, another limitation is that because there is stable integration into the host genome, there might be a potential continued activity of Cas9, which may not be desirable. So one way around this is what a lot of people do is to use induce an inducible system, like a tet inducible Cas9, where the uh, expression of Cas9 is not always on, but you decide there's more control of when the gene gets expressed um, when you're using the Cas9. And I want to show you an example of gene editing with all-in-one lentivirus. Here we have an all-in-one lentivirus um, with gRNA targeting GFP and Cas9, which is packaged into lentivirus, and then um, cells are infected with the lentivirus, cells expressing GFP. And similar to um, the other methods, you can see that in um, the control, there is no, um, the GFP expression is pretty high, and gRNA1 and 2 GFP expression is pretty low, indicating that it was successfully delivered inside and it did its job well. Another example that I want to show is using um, lentiviral vectors for gene regulation for CRISPR-A and CRISPR-I. So in here is an example of CRISPR-A where the promoter region of BRN2, um, the, the gene, 
is being targeted by the CRISPR-A system. And in here you can see that in the controls, mRNA levels didn't change much, but in the experimental sample, the mRNA levels increased because we are doing CRISPR-A with the transactivation system. And similarly with CRISPR-I, um, we have a, a CR, CXCR4 gene, the promoter region being targeted by the CRISPR-I system, which was delivered using lentiviral vectors. And the mRNA levels were unchanged in controls, but the levels were greatly reduced in the experimental um, sample because this is a CRISPR-I system, which causes um, repression of the target gene. Okay, hopefully I have given you um, an overview of uh, experimental tips and practical design tips of choosing the right uh, vector components and choosing the right delivery methods for your experimental needs. I want to take a minute to talk about uh, Vector Builder and what are the things that we offer that can help you with your CRISPR needs. So one of the things is we have multiple different delivery systems. Like you can see, there is regular plasmid, viruses, piggyback, which is a transposon um, for knockdowns, knock-in, um, gene regulation, all of these different uh, ways that you can use CRISPR in different delivery systems. And we also have an online tool where you can design your vector components online um, in a very intuitive way. So here is an example of what that online tool looks like. You can add guide RNAs uh, from our database or your own, or you can add um, Cas protein. We have a multiple, uh, a whole list of popular Cas lines that are available. Um, and our guide RNAs, we have a database where we have optimized our guide RNAs for minimal off-target effects. So you can choose from that database and you add the Cas9, and we have a whole range of markers available that you can choose for your experimental purposes. And um, you click and order, and um, that's it. You can design everything online. We also have plenty of educational resources. Uh, we have very extensive guides for all of the expression systems that I have shown here. We have articles, blog posts, um, videos, talking through the different um, CRISPR components and delivery mechanisms, applications, all of these things, um, and citations of uh, the publications that have used it. And if you want a little bit more control in your backbone and more component, more control in your uh, in designing your CRISPR components, you can also use Vector-B. This is a free software that you can use uh, to view, edit, edit, and analyze your DNA sequences with almost unlimited customizations um, for your very specific needs. And once and all of this um, can be done online. And once all of this is done online, um, you can uh, just hit a button that says add to cart and um, we can deliver that for you. And in addition to that, we also offer um, some downstream services. For example, you've um, chosen your Cas9, you've chosen your guide RNA and everything. We are able to clone that for you and um, send the experiment ready vectors to your doorstep. But if you want to decide that you want to package it into a virus, and if you want to do a viral transduction, we can do viral packaging as well. And if you want to do library, so uh, use our library services, we offer a whole range of services from construction and screening, starting from design, guide RNA design, all the way to um, cloning and uh, screening and analysis. So we offer that, and we are also able to offer stable cell line generation, where stable cell lines for specific um, mutations or knock-ins or knock-outs um, are also available, and we can do that for you. Um, yeah, so these are some of the services that we have for our CRISPR offerings. And uh, with that, I will take any questions if you have any.